Now let's continue forward into the future. Now, interestingly enough, the gas centrifuge was a technology that was actually known about in the 1940s. However, they abandoned it then, just like deepener networks, because they didn't have materials that could actually withstand the process. Um, they couldn't spin it fast enough with the materials they had. And also, bearings were just constantly eating up all the energy because it requires a bearing right here because we're spinning something very, very fast. But with all that being said, you know, we eventually created better bearings. We eventually had better materials. We were able to bring this um, process to life. And in doing that, we found something that was both practical and very economical. But how does it work? Well, let's just look at it. So a gas centrifuge is a centrifuge with a gas in it. And so what it is doing is it is spinning ridiculously fast, very, 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 very fast. And as it spins quickly, what happens is we begin to have a separation of the gases. The more dense, heavier gases will go to the outside edges and the lighter gases will stay towards the center. This is the same as with air. If you look at air and you're just looking at the ground and you're going, you're going up from there, well, you'll find that it's less dense high up and more dense towards the ground. Now, this is because of gravity squishing the molecules down, but it's still the same process here because we're just talking about gravity as an acceleration. And when we spin something, we cause an acceleration. However, they were able to improve this even more. How? Well, what they did was they added a heat gradient. Sorry, a temperature gradient. Um, they apply heat at the bottom. They keep it cool at the top. And so once again, we have separation. So we have U-235, which is lighter, going to the top. We have U-238, which is heavier, going to the bottom because lighter things rise, cool, um, heavier things fall to the bottom. And so both of these together make this very good at separating out my materials. And so I get an equation here, which is a big equation. But the big thing we see is that the greater my difference between the mass of my heavy, my light atoms, as well as the greater the amount of spinning I have, the better my separation factor will be. So let's try this out and see how it works. So since we have new materials, in this case composites, we can have very, very high rotation speeds. And so we want to figure out what is the separation factor for a carbon fiber composite with a peripheral speed of 600 meters per second. Now, if you actually looked at that equation in the past, you say, wait a second, we didn't have velocity in there. We had angular velocity. So what's this peripheral speed thing? Well, don't worry. It's not being crazy. Um, this is simply saying that if you have something spinning, the peripheral speed is simply equal to how fast it's going in a line at the edge, tangent to my circle which is simply equal to my angular velocity times the radius. Nothing bad there. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and calculate our separation factor. So we had this equation from earlier, where our separation factor is equal to how much my uh, um, natural abundance or my abundance ratio has changed from one stage to the other. And so I can realize that, well, that's just my ratio then of my abundance afterwards to my abundance before. Also, I went ahead and changed this from being equal to my angular velocity squared times my radius squared to just being um, equal to the peripheral velocity squared. So we plug this in here. Once again, the difference in mass is very, very small between um, U238 and U235. But we have a very high velocity spinning them, which is still going to give us some good separation. Also, this is the standard temperature we were using for this particular reactor. Don't worry about that too much for this class. And so with this, we get that one stage has a separation factor of 1.22. Remember that for a gas diffusion, we had 1.003. So this is already having a much better effect at separating. Now, one caveat on that is that while, yes, it has a much higher separation factor, we can only run, we can run less mass through each stage. Um, per unit time. And so with that, we have to have a lot of these in parallel and in series to make sure we get the enrichment we want at the rates we want. So you're like, okay, well, is this all that much better than if it's kind of slower, I have to use more of these? Well, yes, it's still better because the power consumption is an order of magnitude lower compared to gas diffusion. So with the higher separation factor, 
and the much lower um, the power usage, this is still much better for us and it's econo economically viable. Also, as we make better materials, we get faster rotation speeds, which lead to even better separation factors. Like for example, here are various different um, uranium enrichment plants um, that are using this technology. You can see as I go from top to bottom, I'm going to more recent years and going from aluminum to steel to finally carbon fiber composite. And so my separation power, which is just how much I can separate um, per um, energy it uses to do that, is jumping dramatically. So it goes from about 0.44 in 1960 to 330 in 2008. And you can see that even just from 1980 to 2008, we had a humongous jump as we went from steel to carbon fiber composite because we were able to increase this velocity dramatically. So the better our materials, the better this technology gets and the more selective it is. Okay, so we're gonna stop there and next time we'll be jumping into how we determine how much fuel it'll take to get a particular amount of enriched product. So thanks for listening and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.